Welcome to Mayo Medical Laboratory's Hot Topics. These presentations provide short discussion of current topics and may be helpful to you in your practice. Today our topic looks at hereditary platelet disorders and the role of platelet electron microscopy and platelet surface glycoprotein expression levels in diagnosis. Our speaker for this program is Dr. Dong Chen, co-director of the Special Coagulation Laboratory in the Department of Laboratory Medicine and Pathology at Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. Dr. Chen is also an Associate Professor of Laboratory Medicine and Pathology in the College of Medicine. Dr. Chen, thank you for presenting with us today. So welcome and thank you for attending this hot topic session. Here are my disclosures. I'm a member of a College of American Pathologist Coagulation Resource Committee and the North American Specialized Coagulation Laboratory Association Platelet Proficiency Testing Group. In today's talk, I will first briefly describe categorization of a hereditary platelet disorders. Then I will discuss in more detail about platelet electron microscopy and the platelet surface glycoprotein assessment by flow cytometry in the diagnosis of hereditary platelet disorders. Platelets are essential for primary hemostasis. They are first released from bone marrow megakaryocytes in circulation. At the damaged vascular site, Platelets combines to expose the subendothelial collagen uh, via glycoprotein 1B van Willebrand factor binding and the platelet collagen receptor glycoprotein 1A, 2A, GP6. Platelets are subsequently um, activated through signal transduction and contents of granules are released. The release of ADP from boxin A2 and other molecules further activate platelets and cause conformation change of glycoprotein 2B3A, which then bind to fibrinogen and form platelet aggregates. Hereditary platelet disorders are caused by defects in this sequential platelet activation process. We thus can categorize the platelet defect into platelet synthetic defect, surface receptor deficiency, signal transduction deficiency, and lastly, storage pool deficiency. In order to accurately diagnose platelet disorders, we need a systemic approach, which include collection of patients' personal and family bleeding histories, CBC and peripheral blood smear review, platelet function test, and finally, more esoteric testing, including platelet electron microscopy, flow cytometry, and the genotypic studies. Of the routine tests, platelet functional tests, especially the platelet aggregation test, remain the gold standard laboratory testing to diagnose various platelet disorders. The first platelet light transmission aggregometry, as shown here, was invented by Dr. Gustav Born in 1962. This invention ignited an explosion of knowledge of platelet biology in the past 50 years and became a reference method for diagnosing platelet disorders. Here is an example of the platelet aggregation tracing. It includes an initial baseline indicated as A, a spike of increased turbidity due to platelet shape change B, the first wave of platelet aggregation C, and second wave of aggregation E. Sometimes the first wave of aggregation is reversible D while the second wave of aggregation is usually irreversible. Using a battery of agonists and their corresponding platelet aggregation patterns, various types of platelet defect can be identified. For instance, the lack of restocetin-induced platelet aggregation and normal response to other agonists are characteristic for bernard sullier syndrome. The absence of aggregation response to virtually all agonists except for ristocetin is diagnostic for Glanzmann thromboethenia. Decreased platelet aggregation response to collagen is likely due to glycoprotein 1A, 2A, or glycoprotein 6 deficiency. However, platelet aggregation in general is insensitive to platelet storage pool deficiency, which is likely most common platelet disorder based on recent studies. Platelet storage pool deficiency is caused by either granule deficiency or defect 
in granule release. Platelet transmission electron microscopy, or PTEM in short, is the gold standard for assessing platelet ultrastructures such as dense and alpha granules. There are three main tests. Platelet hole mount TEM is to quantify dense granules. Platelet thin section TEM is the method to visualize ultrastructures such as alpha granules and inclusions. Buffy code TEM is to examine aberrant inclusions in white cells. Platelet TEM was first used to study human platelets in 1950s. In the past 50 years, Dr. James White at University of uh, Minnesota devoted his career in establishing platelet TEM as an invaluable tool to diagnose various platelet disorders, such as hermansky putlak syndrome and gray platelet syndrome, etc. After his retirement, he continued to perform platelet TEM research and clinical studies and generously helped our validation of a platelet EM testing at our institution. Now let us first look at whole mount platelet electron microscopy. Whole blood samples collected in ACD tubes are first centrifuged to prepare platelet-rich plasma. Platelet-rich plasma are then dropped on a coated copper grid. After the grid is air-dried, it is then directly examined by TEM. Here is a micrograph of the whole mount image of a platelet. Calcium in the dense granules can block the electron beam and cause an ink dot-like shadow. Therefore, whole mount TEM is a quick and reliable method to evaluate platelet dense granules. In contrast, this whole mount TEM image shows no dense granules, a characteristic feature of hermansky putlak syndrome. However, this feature is not pathognomonic and can be seen in Wiscott Outreach syndrome, Chadiak Higashi syndrome, Jacobson Parachuso syndrome, and other severe dense granule deficiencies. Not every opaque object on whole mount TEM is dense granule. A collaboration with Dr. White, we first presented our dense granule calling criteria in the 2013 annual meeting of American Society of Hematology. Dense granules should have uniformly dark texture, perfectly round and sharp contour, and greater than 100 nanometer in diameter. The larger, pale, and frequently irregular shaped granules are likely alpha granules. There are also background chains and other unspecific opaque bodies which should not be counted as dense granules. We provide this criteria to all nine participants of NASCOLA electron microscopy dense granule interpretation challenges. Each laboratory was asked to count the number of dense granules in the provided image as shown on the left. We observed very good agreement among different uh, laboratories. After establishing the dense granule calling criteria, we studied normal range of mean dense granule count per platelet. In this study, we enrolled 111 healthy donors with balanced gender. We counted at least 100 platelets of each donor sample. The lower normal cutoff is 1.2 dense granules per platelet. We also found the dense granule count were not associated with age or gender. This normal range will be critical to identify mild to moderate dense granule deficiencies. Finally, stability studies showed that whole blood collected in ACD tubes and stored at room temperature gave stable dense granule counts for up to four days. Therefore, TEM study can be actually performed on properly transported samples. Next, we examine platelet ultrastructure by thin section electron microscopy, which will allow us to examine platelet size, shape, alpha granules, canicular system, Golgi complex, aberrant inclusions. Here is an example of so-called gray platelet 
which lacks alpha granules as shown on the right. Sometimes we need to look at white cells. For example, among the differential diagnosis of marked dense granule deficiency, we can diagnose Chaitya Higashi syndrome by examining abnormal lysosomal inclusions in neutrophils by Buffy code electron microscopy. Here is an example. Besides dense granule deficiency, abnormal inclusions are present in neutrophils and platelets. This case was a confirmed case of Chadia Kagashi syndrome. Uh, now let us switch gears to talk about platelet flow cytometry. Platelet surface receptors are essential for platelet function. Glycoprotein 2B3A is the fibrinogen receptor. Its deficiency causes Glanzmann thromboethenia. Both glycoprotein 1-alpha, 2-alpha, and glycoprotein 6 are collagen receptors, and their deficiency will cause abnormal platelet aggregation response to collagen. Glycoprotein 1B59 binds von Willebrand factor. Their abnormality causes bernard soulier syndrome. We developed a quantitative flow cytometry panel to measure these six platelet surface glycoproteins. Platelets collected in ACD2 are stained with fluorescent labeled specific antibodies. Platelets are first gated by light scatter, and then the mean fluorescent intensity, MFI, of each antibody is measured. The raw MFI is divided by the median of normal donor MFI and give a percentage of expression level. We also established the normal range of all six glycoproteins as shown in this table. Expression levels of these glycoproteins are all above 60 to 70 percent. Whole blood collected in ACD tubes and stored at room temperature give stable results of all glycoprotein levels for up to four days. There are no overt change in MFI of the six markers. Here is an example of a normal donor platelet flow cytometry histogram. Qualitatively, the platelets have normal expression level of glycoproteins. Here are histograms of a case of uh, Glanzmann thromboethenia. You may notice that the platelets have decreased CD41 and CD61 expression. Here are the final results and interpretation of the case. The expression level of each glycoproteins are measured and converted to percentage of median normal expression. Expression of a GP2B is at 1.2% and GP3A is at 6.1%. These findings are consistent with Glanzmann thromboethenia. Finally, I would like to emphasize that the diagnosis of a hereditary platelet disorder requires systemic approach, which includes clinical history collection, CBC, and the peripheral blood smear review, platelet function testing, and esoteric testing. Today, I introduce to you two new tests, platelet electron microscopy and the flow cytometry. This battery of phenotyping tests will also assist the future evaluation of genotypic testing of hereditary platelet disorders. Finally, thank you for your attention. Please do not hesitate to contact us if you have any questions regarding this test.